Did it make you accept it? No. All right. Sometimes it makes people accept. The it did. I accepted um, it. <clears throat> okay. You accept it. Oh, I didn't see it. All right. Uh, Jeff, what's up, man? How are you? Doing well. You? We just found out we're like, you know, from the same city, but I'm not there right now. There you go. <laughs> it's where all the cool people live. Yeah, uh, for sure. It's, it's Texas and Denver now, right? Like you either moved to Denver or Austin. This is like and I city. just moved from Austin to Denver. Uh, I was just about to ask you, are you from here? Okay. So you were in Austin, moved to Denver. What made you move to Denver, man? Pandemic created a lot of opportunities. And when COVID hit, we work with a lot of companies. And I just kept hearing owners because I would ask them, what do you think the future of work is going to look like? And they consistently said, I think it's going to be more virtually based, physically enhanced. I think some people will do all or nothing, but I think most people are going to land on a hybrid that is more virtually based. And I remember sitting down with my partners and saying, you know, if that's the future of work and we teach companies how to be productive, shouldn't we be one of those companies so we actually have authority moving forward? And they said, that's a really good point. And my wife and I had already had a trip to Denver booked. It was in two weeks from that conversation because we were going to scout. Um, we Our goal was to scout one mountain location a year to figure out where we would eventually want to ca- call home. And you know, instead of it being a let's scout a mountain community, it became a let's go buy a house trip, which is exactly what we did. All right. So it was just that simple. It was that simple. When when you're clear on what you want, the dominoes just line up really easily. And I 100% agree with you here, and we'll get more into this in a second. Explain what what you mean by virtually based. uh, Physically enhanced. Physically enhanced, yes. Yeah, so a lot of companies, we're talking companies, medium to large size companies are wrestling with what are they going to do? Are they going to require everybody to come back to the office? There are some companies that are doing that, but a lot of people don't want to go that route. So what they're doing is they're providing more flexibility where maybe you're working virtually three days a week and two days you're in the office, or maybe you're virtually and you come into the office as needed. But if you look at the number of days in a month, I think you're going to see most companies will probably have most of their people not in the office most days, and it's not an all or nothing. I don't think the majority of companies are going fully virtual the way that my company did. They're still gonna require in-person elements. I'm super interested to see what happens in, you know, five years or so, like with these big office buildings, because it just doesn't seem as though, like it's gonna be necessary. Like who's gonna, like you don't need this massive building. They'll just be repurposed. I mean, spaces are getting redesigned for more collaboration, less office and cubicle and more creative space and collaboration. Um, Maybe it's not all corporate, who knows? We're gonna find out. Right. So you've mentioned your company here a couple of times. Tell me what your company is. Tell tell the audience what your company is. Hold on one second, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Daphne, Daddy's. My daughter just had cavities done today let me get let me help move her real quick all right let's rock and roll yeah, go ahead. So your company, what, what is your company? What do you do? Yeah, so the company's called Productive and it's a training company based on the best-selling book, The One Thing, which okay. is one of the highest rated business books of all time at this point okay. at least. So very much we're, we're in the business of time. It's our most valuable resource. But the problem is everybody spends it. Very few people and- know how to invest it. I think they spend, oh, I like how you said that, invest it. Yeah, because I think people spend their time as if they are going to get more of it. And that's not a guarantee. Well, they spend it with no expectation of a return. Okay. And here's how it works. You fire up your computer. What's the first thing you check? Uh, Facebook or Instagram. Yeah. Email. One of those. And people do that until they go to their first meeting. They get out of their first meeting. They have five minutes. So they check one of those three things, right? then somebody calls or swings by and asks, hey, you got a minute. And because they're a team player, they say, yes. And that repeats all day long. And they look up at the end of the day, knowing they were busy, but questioning if they actually got anything done. Okay. So what's the one thing? Tell me about the one thing. 
the one thing is the surprisingly simple truth behind extraordinary results. And it's that when you look at all the stuff that's on your plate, it's not of equal importance. It's just like when we were kids and we lined dominoes up, you didn't stand one up over here and one over there and one way over there and knock each one down individually. At five years old, we understood, stand them up, line them up and just whack away at the first one and everything else becomes easier or unnecessary. So that's the same thing. We can look at any area of your life, whether it's professionally or personally, you give me any area of your life, we can look at a goal that you want to achieve and you can narrow it down to a one thing, a lead domino that if you just did that consistently day after day after day, over time, you would unleash extraordinary results in that area of your life. And did you write the book? No, book? My, my partners did. Okay. And tell me what, so, so tell me more about the idea of this one thing, because man, you, you so hooked me here with this, this thing on time. Yeah. Because uh, we do, we, we start every meeting with like a, a segue, you know, uh, something either like a personal success or, you know, a would you rather. And the other day we had a would you rather of, would you rather be able to run at a hundred miles an hour or fly at 10 miles an hour? And for me, I was like, yo, look, I want to run at 100. Because if I can run at 100, that means I can run a little bit slower than that as well. I'll play in the NFL, be the best running back of all time, win a gold medal, you know, in the Olympics at, at all of the races. No one will have ever done that before. It will just be me. I'll have all this money. But for me, it doesn't come down to the money. It comes down to that um, I want to travel a lot. I, li I like to travel. And God damn, the airport is a waste of time. And I mm. don't have enough money right now to fly private. Who, you know, not many do. Um, but private is so much less time, you know, like it would be baller. And I don't look, give me the amenities of coach other than the large seat. I don't, you don't need to feed me. I, I don't need a, 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 um, a steward there to have nothing. I don't need any of that. Put the drinks up front and just let me get there faster and not have to wait four hours on each end. Yeah, I get it. Where this came from. So um, are you familiar with Keller Williams by chance, the real estate company, the real estate company? Yeah. Yeah. So Gary Keller is my partner. So okay, th this is how he built Keller Williams from a small little okay. company in Austin to number one in the world with 200,000 plus people. Right. For him, he believed that working long hours, that hustling and grinding was the key to success until his life was falling apart. Literally, he was having major health issues and he had to fundamentally change the way that he viewed time. And he stopped being the first one in, the last one out. He stopped just hustling and grinding. And he realized what it came down to was if you do the most important thing, everything else is everything else. And so he started to live this himself. He started to coach this with his leaders that they would always have clarity on what is the most important thing. I know there's a lot of stuff on your plate and I know you're going to do more than one thing. We all have more than one thing. And if you could only do one thing, what's the one thing you can do today? Such that by doing it, ever everything else will be easier or unnecessary. Does the one thing ever change? All the time. Depends on the person. Okay. A salesperson's okay. one thing is pretty consistent. Prospect. Sell. Sell. Right. Yeah, exactly. A writer's one thing, pretty consistent. Write. I'm an executive. My one thing changes on a daily basis. There's a lot of things that are going on inside our organization, but I'm always clear what is the most important thing that I can do today. So what's and the most important thing you could do today? I already did it. It was a sales call. Okay. So you're but done. I'm, I've knocked that domino down. But here's, here's the crazy thing. One, if we ask the average person, what's your one thing today? They wouldn't know. And by the way, there's no judgment. It's a big question. Right. Because we've never been taught to think this way. Second, even if they have clarity on it, if we open up their digital calendar, it's probably filled with a bunch of meetings and random to-dos. Their calendar does not actually reflect their priority. And what do they follow? The calendar. The calendar. So they follow a calendar that inherently sets them up to do the things that do not deliver the highest impact. I'm trying to digest here. <laughs> I know, it's a, it's a big concept. It's, <laughs> it's simple big, it and it's like- simple, Yeah. Yeah, that's how you know it's good. It's because it's simple, but it's not easy. It's, you know, it's simple, and it's like you're holding up a mirror and you're going, oh, snap. Right, right. So, Kamar, do you know what your one thing is tomorrow? Let me look. Oh, so you have this shit written down. 
<laughs> oh, my friend. I can tell you what my top, let's look for this week. I can tell you what my top six priorities are for the week, and I can draw a straight line to how knocking those six dominoes down automatically puts me on track for the most important goals this month, which automatically put me on track for the most important goals for the year, which automatically put me on track for owning my piece of the business plan, which puts me on track for a 10 year vision for our organization and my life. Digest like that. This. Yeah, no, I like this. <laughs> I have, okay. So I, I mean, I follow a similar pattern, but I get lost in the minutia a lot, right? Um, uh, of to do's right of having something to do where like I have my 10 years like I, I like what I want in 10 years is I have that shit laid out it's on my board I look at it every day um, I know what I have to do in five years to get to 10 I know what I have to do in three to get to five and I know what I got to do in one to get to three and I know what my rocks are you know like my quarter what do I have to get done this quarter and I know what my to do's are for a day but there's a lot of them here's the problem yeah, a me. lot of people who set goals have, have set goals for the f distant future to the year, maybe down to mm -hmm. 90 days. But here's the problem. If you ask them what belongs on their calendar this week or even today, they don't know. They don't right. know how to bridge that gap. We do that. Explain the process to me a little bit. because this, I mean, this is gold, right? And I know yeah. you can't explain the whole process, you know. Well, first in 10 minutes, but first we have to fly up to 10,000 feet. What do you think the purpose of a goal is? The purpose of a goal is to get you something in your life that you want to, to satisfy a need that you have. Most, most people answer with something similar to that, something along the lines of to achieve a result. That's what yeah. I thought until my partner, Gary, taught me differently. He said, that's wrong. He said, the purpose of a goal is actually to be appropriate in the moment. Your goal is a compass that tells you if the actions you are taking today are in the right direction or not. Explain more. It's not about the result. It's about the destination. It's about the journey you go on. The journey. So if my goal is to achieve X in revenue or make this much money or get in this type of health or have this kind of marriage. It's not about, do I have that kind of marriage or not? Is my net worth at that dollar amount or not? It's about if I want to have that kind of net worth, who's the person I need to become? And what actions can I take today that are in alignment with that vision for my life? God damn, this is, this is even holistic. It's not even like about uh well, like about the things like you were just saying about the the average every day like okay i want i want 10 million i want this house i want this car or whatever it is who do i have to become to get that stuff to have that stuff happen and if and i need to become that person what actions what I would i take today that would okay, put me so, in alignment with that okay so your one big thing today was the sales meeting yeah that was an that was an actual thing that you had to do. So ex explain that, that bridge there for me, that gap. Your one thing is an activity, not a result. This is one of the biggest challenges that people have. They know the results they need to achieve, but if you ask them, what do you need to do to make that happen? They will look at you and sometimes say, I don't know. Okay, okay so my question, God, you, I have so many questions for you right now, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, so like, what is your... What is your goal, I guess? Like, because you're saying in a, in a very we, holistic way. So I can, I, can, I can break it down. Yeah. Our organization has a clear one thing for the year. It is a specific revenue dollar for a, through a specific channel through our corporate training and consulting. In order for that to happen, my piece of that plan, I'm the person who owns growth. So my one thing for the year as an organization is 250 hours of lead generation that will drive a very specific dollar amount in revenue. Okay, but that's not, so now you, now you, I guess you have moved now from this, you said the goal was something that you're gonna have to be, right? The journey you're gonna go on. So, yeah. But, but right now you're giving me, when I asked you what your goal was, you talk revenue and- So watch, watch. Okay, I go. started with yeah. the result we want to achieve. The company okay. wants to achieve a certain revenue. I'm in charge of revenue. I'm in charge of okay. driving growth. So my one okay. thing for the year is not the dollar amount. 
It's the activity, 250 hours of lead generation that will drive that revenue number. Now, if we work it, I can work it down to, I know I need to do 30 hours this month, which means I know I need to do eight hours this week. Who's the person I need to become? I need to become the type of person who has consistent lead generation time blocks on my calendar that I protect. It's not about, it's less about, did you get eight hours or not? That is a product of being the type of person that when I look at my calendar, I make sure that there is time blocked and protected for me to do those activities that will drive those results. What about like your health and wellness and all that as well? Perfect. Like how do you, yes. I know <laughs> that 20 years from now, I have a vision for what I want my health to look like. And I've reversed engineered that back to this year. And I know that I need to exercise 250 times this year to the point that I can tell you I need to exercise 20 times this month. And I can tell you I need to exercise four times this week. I have dialed it all the way back. What Wealth, I have a very specific, I can tell you right here. Um, my wealth goal for this year is to grow my net worth by 75%. And I know exactly what I need to do to make that happen. Were you broke coming into this year? No. <laughs> Not at all. Yeah, 75%. So, okay, not quite double. Not quite double. Not quite double. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to double it this year. All right. I already know what's going to happen. I'm going to double it this year. And that's because seven years ago, I read Robert Kiyosaki's book, Cash Flow Quadrant. I read Rich Dad Poor Dad when I was like eight. Um, and I read okay. Cash Flow Quadrant. I realized I need to be a business owner and an investor. And so I started asking the question, who's the person I need to become? And I knew I needed, I needed to surround myself with other business owners, investors. I had to get out of being an employee. I was in medical device sales at the time. I knew I had to become a business owner. It's what got me into relationship with Gary and Jay. I achieved some of my wealth building goals like that I never thought I'd be able to achieve in my lifetime. I actually hit last year at my five year mark. And now that I've been going down that journey for seven years of knocking the dominoes down, it's like compound interest. It's starting to right. compound and it's starting to compound fast. That's what compound interest does. That's it's right. Nothing. It's nothing for the first, you know, I'm doing this with one of my students. He, I have a kid. He, you know, started between his five years old and, uh, He's older now, you know, he's like 19, 18. He's moving out of his parents' house, you know, Mexican kid, grew, grew up poor his whole life. And uh, I don't want his money. Like, I don't want his tuition money. He's 19 years old. He's trying to make it in the world. But I don't think that I teach martial arts, right? Yeah. I have martial arts schools as well on top of this, you know, uh, but I don't think he should, you know, do nothing with it. I don't want him to just go have fun with it. So I was like, look, we have two options here. You can either pay me. Well, you can just open this account over there and you're going to put it in that account. You're going to put that tuition amount in that account every month. And we'll see, we'll talk in 10 yeah. years. Yeah. You know, so. so um, let's fly up to 10,000 feet because I, I want to make yeah. sure I deliver a clear message. Yeah, please. Um, it's not about what my net worth is. It's not about how many times did I work out. It's not about how many hours am I going to lead generate. I'm just giving you specific examples that are relevant to me. Those types right. of things may be appealing to you. They may not be. The, the question that I asked myself that I would empower you to ask yourself is, what would an extraordinary life actually look like to me? Someday from now, like 10 years, 20 years down the road, what would that look like? Most people, by the way, are going to say, I don't know, and they're going to give up thinking. Search for the answer. I've done that work, and I've gotten clarity around what does family look like? What does health look like? What does an amazing career look like? What does amazing wealth look like? What does amazing spirituality look like? And I've been able to reverse engineer that back to the point that I can set some very clear goals that I want to happen this year. And I know that I have to become the type of person who does the activities on a consistent basis that allows me to earn the right to achieve those goals. And I track it every week and my calendar reflects those priorities. This is kind of the model and the system behind the one thing. Did you have something happen that made you like? Yes. Okay. 
I was in medical device sales. It was an amazing job. I woke up every day running through hospitals, selling a device that actually saved lives. And because I got to wear scrubs every day, I tried to get my wife to call me McDreamy. And she's fantastic. Call you, call you what? McDreamy. You ever watch Grey's Anatomy? No. Okay. Well, <laughs> let's put it this way. Some of your people just chuckled. <laughs> but even though I was in a great job with a really great lifestyle, I was lacking fulfillment. Growth is my number one core value. And I felt like I was meant for more. I felt like I was not growing the way I needed to be growing. Problem was I had these very comfortable golden handcuffs on and I did not want to take them off. Then uh, my colleague has a stroke at age 35. And at the time, my wife and I had just bought a house in Orange County and just had our first child and she quit her job to become a stay-at-home mom. And I am realizing, oh, snap. If what happened to my colleague had happened to me, what happens to my family? And this is when I'm reading Cash Flow Quadrant, realizing I'm in the employee column. I'm not actually a business owner or a true investor yet. And the entire last chapter was dedicated to mentors. And I heard the Jim Rohn quote, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Looked at my five, saw the names of five amazing friends and realized I had five amazing friends, but I had zero amazing mentors. Nobody who was actually where I wanted to be, who could actually advise me on the best way to get there as fast as possible. That became my one thing at the time, surround myself with the right people. I started a podcast about it called The Mentee, where I was a mentee recording conversations with private mentors. And then it was our national sales meeting. Jay Papazan, who co-authored The One Thing with Gary, was the speaker. And when he came off stage, I cornered him. I had no idea that he and Gary had been hunting for a CEO for this company, but I ended up being the right fit. And so I quit a very lucrative W-2 job to become an entrepreneur, but with the mentorship of a multimillionaire and a billionaire. And I just took their models and systems and was a sponge and started living it. And now I'm in the position where not only has it changed my life, but we've changed the lives of millions of people. And we take this into organizations across the globe and it helps people achieve more by focusing on the things that matter most, period. It's interesting how everybody has something that like you know, this shift that you've made, you know, like it's always like, a defining moment. Something happens to me. Yeah. There's something that happens to you where you're just like, God damn, you know, what was the, well, tell, tell my, tell, tell the audience like, uh, cause it wasn't that pretty, you know, like, like it, it's ne- like the shift is never pretty. Like you, you wrap, you know, it, that was a, that was a good story. But what was like, what was the dark time of that shift? Like what, what did, what were you feeling at the time? Like, what was, what were your fears and your nights? And like, you know, um, it's it hard to was Go ahead. not only did my colleague have a stroke, but my company slashed my income by 40%. And I had made a mistake, which is the mistake of allowing your lifestyle to rise as your income level rises. This is a mistake. Probably most people listening to this have made or are making currently. And when my income went down, my lifestyle did not just auto-correct. I told myself the story, oh, it'll get better next month, but it didn't. And I told myself that story every month for months. And it was at the point where we are literally almost out of money, like bank account almost at zero. And I'm just going to tell you a mortgage in in Orange County, California is not cheap. And I am, as a provider, it rocked me to my core because I'm literally staring at my wife and my baby girl wondering how am I going to put food on the table? What was the mortgage? Oh, it was over three grand a month. Yeah. It's a big mortgage. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And um, that's when I realized I had to take control. That's when I had to venture into the world of entrepreneurship and to scale our lifestyle back, to hold down a full-time job with a newborn, getting no sleep while also starting a company on the side It was hard. I mean, I was up early in the morning. I'm up late at night. I was working my tail off and it was not doing wonders for my marriage. I mean, transparently, it wasn't until about 18 months ago that we finally actually started making the kind of money that we really needed to be able to make for us to not feel this pressure when it came to money. So we're talking, you know, four and a half, five years of really focusing on what mattered to actually build a business, a real business. Yeah, but 
but your business partners, I mean, like this is just part of their thing and this is your thing, right? You're talking about a millionaire and a billionaire. For, for Gary Keller, if this goes bad, bro, I, you know. Yeah. It's a rounding error. Whatever. It's a, round, cool. it's a rounding error. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's been life-changing for my family for because explain, of what we built. Explain that. Yeah, explain that. Well, first and foremost, in terms of what it's done to teach me how to think. How I think now, five and a half years ago, I was an employee. I had never run a company. Five and, now fast forward to where we are today, I advise Fortune 500 executives. And it's not because of me. It's because of what I've learned from Gary. He has models and systems for everything. And look at what he's built. I have been living those for five and a half years to the point that I've earned the right to now take these to other businesses and help them live them. And what that has done in terms of um, my identity, I used to be a, bus a businessman with a family. Now I'm actually a family man with a business. There's a very big difference there. And just from a wealth building standpoint, it's been what I believe we can achieve now is not even something I thought was in the realm of possibilities five and a half years ago. Yeah. It's very interesting. Uh, you touched on this thing, identity here for a second. Uh, this is one of my big things is like, you have to know who you are. Mm. It, like uh, I work with fighters as well. Um, and for a fighter, for example, uh, if your identity is wrapped up, it's all wrapped up. It can be partly wrapped up, but if it's all wrapped up in this cage and this result you're going to have, this, this, this has a lot more importance than just winning and losing some stupid fucking barely legal fight on a Saturday night, right? Like it, it's going to crush your world. Yeah. But if we can start to separate the two, now we're talking. So this identity piece, and you've kind of been talking about it the whole time. Uh, who will I have to be? Who will I have to become? to make this happen, right? Mm -hmm. this, this is all identity. Everything you've been talking about here is identity. Um, I work with a coach and he goes, who, you gonna, who, do, you, who do you wanna be? And, and he, did, he almost broke it down exactly how you broke it down. Family, socially, vocationally, financially, physically. Uh, there's two more, because there's seven aspects of life, you know? Um, and I can't remember what the other ones are. Uh, what are you gonna have to do, you know? And uh, what, uh, what will you, so that's the uh, altruism. What do you have to give to the world? And what will you get? You know, what, we, what, what will come back to you? And that's the, that's the narcissism. And they, they have to balance. So, but everything you've been talking about is this identity piece. Yeah, who do you have to become? I mean, I remember Jay and I were talking and he asked me a question. He said, how often do you think Gary achieves his goals? And I said, probably a lot. And he said, actually, never. And I asked why. And he said, because if the purpose of a goal is to be appropriate in the moment, the moment he realizes that he's become the type of person who will inevitably achieve that goal, he raises the goal so that he has to reinvent the person he has to become. Yeah, true vision is unattainable. <laughs> swallow right. that one <laughs> yeah that's yeah because most most of us have this ego wrapped up in this like okay i've made it kind of like what you were talking about for yourself and explain to me how you got out of this of like mm -hmm. you know er everyone does it everyone goes okay i i make forty thousand dollars a month i spend 42 <laughs> right because we can put it on credit now correct right? yes yeah like, it's not even that you spend 40 it's not even that you spend 39 and save two somehow you spend more yeah. Well, uh, last year I read a book called The Psychology of Money. Great book. Okay. And one of the, the, the author, Morgan Housel, he interviewed a bunch of multimillionaires and a bunch of billionaires. And he asked them all the same question. At what point did you realize you were wealthy? They all said the same thing. I'm not wealthy. Which was shocking to him. How could you have amassed that kind of fortune and not think that you're wealthy. And what he realized is, is that we as humans, when you focus on the result, the moment you achieve it, you automatically move the goalpost. It's like, imagine playing in the Super Bowl. You're marching toward the end zone. And the moment you get there, you just kick it back another 20 yards. Yeah, but you we get don't there and you that, kick right? it. Pardon? Most people say I've made it. They don't, though. They don't. They're people, yeah. people who watch other people achieve 
big goals, perceive that those people have made it. But when you are the person who quote, hit your goal, the moment you hit it, you don't even celebrate. You just, you just immediately reset the goalpost. I, and this happened to me last year. Jay and I, we were every year we facilitate a couple's goal setting retreat. And we were in Seattle for it because we were doing it virtually. That's where the studio was. And we were sitting down for lunch. And, and that day I figured out that it was inevitable that I hit a net worth goal that has been a life's dream of mine. It was inevitable that it was going to happen by the end of the year. And the moment I realized it, I didn't even, I wasn't even satisfied. I immediately 10 X the number and I went, Holy smokes. I just moved the goalpost. And he said, it's good that you actually know that. So how do you actually celebrate it and find peace in that? Doesn't mean you can't go for more, but don't get caught in that vicious cycle of just always resetting the target. Yeah. It's got to have a balance, right? You you, you have to enjoy it. Because, you know, and like, again, I'll relate this back to fighters. I know, I know for a lot of fighters, um, I'm, I'm, I've been in the game a little bit and I am friends with world champions. And it's cool. The, the moment is cool. But when they take that belt back to their hotel room and it's just them and the belt and the goal has been achieved, it can be this huge letdown almost because it's like, oh my God, okay, but tomorrow the sun's going to come up. I'm just, I'm still, yeah. You know, John Jones. And now what? There was a study that was done that actually focused on um, what we actually value more, the anticipation of a result or the result itself. And what they found is the way our brains are wired is that it's actually the anticipation of the result that brings the most value to us than the actual experience of getting the result. Yeah, you can you can you can touch that anywhere, even even yep. physically, right? Like, so there's something I need to clarify because on one end yeah. I've said it's not about achieving the result; it's about being appropriate in the moment. And on yeah. the other hand, here I am saying, don't move the goalpost. The purpose of a goal is to be appropriate in the moment. It's about how do I constantly raise the goal so that I become a better version of myself. That's about becoming an identity. Not moving the goalpost is about your satisfaction and your sense of accomplishment. You can continue to raise the goal if it serves you to become a better version of yourself. And you should be celebrating the heck out of the fact that you've become who you've become along the way. You should not hold your satisfaction hostage to you achieving that next target. They both can be true. They both can happen. Both can be true. you know, we do this so often in, in our lives, in the world, our politics, right? It's, it's either or. You, either, you are either or a Democrat or a Republican. And you have to be all the way over right or all the way over left. And this is just such a mistake. Agreed. Um, man, so as we start to close here with, with the conversation, um, I still have a couple questions. And one of them is, this, you doing this, right? You coming, you coming and talking to me because look, Mm -hmm. I'm just some dude. I I don't have this massive audience, right? Like I'm not like if Tim Ferriss hits you up, then yeah, for sure. Uh, you're, you're doing it (laughs) right. Uh, Rogan, any of the, any of these massive podcasts, uh, what, what makes this part of your goal that you're doing? Like why, 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 why are you sitting here talking to me? We have to fly up to 10,000 feet. Okay. If I asked you what a job description is, what would you say? What my job description is or what, what a normal What's the is? definition of a job description or how would you describe a job description? Something for most people, I would say it is something that you do uh, for work that you get paid for yeah. uh, and you are going to have to deliver certain results based on that do- job description. Great answer. You know, most people, when they think of it, they think of all the things you have to do for your job to keep your job, right? Um, We view it very differently. We say a job description is the two to three things a person has to do exceptionally well or they're fired. It automatically forces you to stop looking at everything and identify the most important things. It's the 80-20 rule. 80% of your results come from 20% of your activities. So what's your 20%? Here's why I'm sharing this. My 20% for my role this year, 
One, drive growth. Two, be an ambassador of the brand. And three, surround myself with extraordinary people. Growth, ambassador, people. Doing this is part of being an ambassador. I have clear metrics for how many stages will I speak on? How many podcasts will I do? Because those are the activities that if I do them would result in me being an ambassador of the brand, which means I am doing my job. And you're not concerned with like the level of podcast, obviously. No, I mean, yes and no, but here's the reality. I'm just trying to talk about this yeah. because like so many people are like, oh, that won't have, that, that guy's below me or that guy's a, okay. I, I don't know, view like, it that way. I don't view it okay. that way because pre pandemic, I would get on a plane and fly across the country to speak to a room of 10 people. Granted, you get paid to do that, but that's 10 people. Right. You, right. you look at a podcast, even it's, if it's 50 people, a hundred people, 200 people, it's a lot of you're, people. You're in your, yeah. In your, you're in your house right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. So makes sense. We, yeah. we, we say yes. Got it. No, I mean, look, uh, there's some things that you've definitely made me really think about. And should I say, yeah, I try to say, I try to detach the, what it will do for me so much from the, what it will do as a whole, you know? And, and, and this, is, this is a game that we are, that we are stuck in. You know, that, that so many of us are stuck in, you know, even, even with times of COVID, right? You're, you're seeing it with COVID. It's my freedoms or your, my life. And yeah. you're seeing this dichotomy being played out over and over and over again. And I, I just am not seeing it so clearly as that dichotomy. Yeah, I, I totally get what you're, where you're coming from. And again, if I didn't have my partners, if I hadn't surrounded myself with who I had surrounded myself with, I would have pursued my path entrepreneurially, meaning the best that I could have done it based on my knowledge. But that carries a very low ceiling of achievement because the best you can do is irrelevant. What matters is what's the best that can be done. And I've surrounded myself with some extraordinary people who have poured into me and helped me accelerate my journey. And I just know if one person from this show hears this and it changes their life, it would be an amazing return on the investment of my time. Fuck yeah. That's, that's, that's what it is, right? If, if one person, everyone wants this huge ROI and you talked about ROI earlier, right? Well, I don't remember how we talked about it. When, when yeah. did you, how did you bring it up? People spend, their, it people spend their time. They don't invest it. Yeah. Yeah. So but we not, that's, that's just the way, right? Because if you, what's a life worth? Like what, what's the ROI of one life? If you had to spend 10 grand, but you knew this person's life would be forever be changed for the best, would you do it? Yeah. And here's the thing. When we say change someone's life, that's not hyperbole. That's not fluff. The reason the one thing is one of the highest rated business books of all time is because it literally changes people's lives. Millions of people. And I've seen it happen on our business. I've got the success stories. We've got the testimonials. We know what happens when people actually wake up and realize that going through their days, bouncing from email to meeting to email to yes, if you've got a minute and saying no to that old way of working and actually waking up realizing of all the stuff that's on my plate, it is all not of equal importance. I have to first get clarity on what matters, make sure that my calendar first and foremost has time for block for me to do the most important things. Everything else can flow around that. And no, I am not gonna work long hours and cheat myself out of what it means to live a life. I'm gonna shut it down at a pre-prescribed time and actually go and live an extraordinary life outside of my job. We change people's lives. You fucking love it. I don't, I don't know what else to say. You fucking love it. Like that's, that, that's, that's it, but that's what you want. You know, like that's what you want. Like that is exactly what you want. You fucking love it. Yeah, changed, it changed my life. That's how I can speak yeah. with this level of enthusiasm. Yeah. Um, man, I believe everyone has a, has a unique power, something in the world that makes them amazing. You know, it doesn't necessarily make them money or bring them fame or anything, but it's this, it's this quality inside them, this trade, this, this something. Mm -hmm. what's, your what's your power? 
Are you asking me? I'm asking you. What's your to power? share ideas that change what people think is possible. Share ideas that change what people think is possible. That's why I say yes to doing these. Because I happen to be a decent speaker. And I can share ideas that change what people think is possible. I've been watching it on your face this whole time. Every time I said something where you sat back and you're, you looked up to the ceiling, I watched your mind expand. In those moments, I know I'm living my purpose. Yeah, so I happen to get paid to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. I like it, Jeff. Tell everyone where they can reach you, man. I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, sure. First, uh, if you just Google Jeff Woods, and that's Jeff with the G, G-E-O-F-F, I am the first one that pops up. So you can find me on LinkedIn there. You can always direct message me there. Um, our website is theonething.com. That's with the number one. So the number one thing.com. There you can learn how you can grow yourself, how you can grow your business, all the stuff that we do. And the podcast is called The One Thing as well as the book. And it, that's all spelled out. The O-N-E-T-H-I-N-G. Subscribe to the podcast. We have an episode that comes out every week. All right. Thanks so much for coming on. Guys, as always, Jeff has his unique and his own power. I have my unique and own power. Don't go out in the world and try to be Jeff. And don't go out in the world and try to be me. Go out there and find your power.